as I told back to the group, um, this is going to be a little bit longer than the other uh, piece of presentations, just because for my point, it's going to take a while to, uh, to get this point across as, as eloquently as I can. Um, if it gets too boring, you're free to leave. Um, but yeah, please, I'm, the one thing I ask is please keep an open mind, because these are going to be a lot of ideas a lot of people haven't heard. Um, and here we go. My thesis is on, it's called Leaving the Cave, an Amiable Introduction to Anarchy, a Free Market Manifesto. Now they say if you gave a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, then he's got to get a fishing license, but he doesn't have any money. So now he's got to get a job and get into the social security system and pay taxes. And now you're going to audit the poor guy because he's not really good with math. Then you pull the IRS man up to his house. He'll take all his stuff, his black velvet Elvis, his Batman toothbrush, his crucifix, and that one goes up for auction. So now the burden of proof is on him because he forgot to carry the one because he was just worried about eating a fish. And he couldn't even cook the fish, and he needed a permit for an open flame. And then the health department is going to start asking questions about where he's going to dump the scales and the guts and say, this is not a sanitary environment. And ladies and gentlemen, if you get sick of it all at the end of the day, it's not even legal to kill yourself in this country. You were born free, you got happily taken, and you wave a flag celebrating it. That's from a stand-up special by Doug Stanhope, speaking on freedom. An anarcho-capitalist libertarian society would bring about the most peaceful society ever seen throughout the course of human history. Anarchy is not a solution. Anarchy is a critique. The purpose of this work is to bring your mind and to resolve the misunderstanding of anarchist thought. Quote, the anarchists cannot be blamed for the world's chaos and terror for its wars and prison camps and execution chambers, for its surveillance of citizens, for the confiscations of people's property, and for the ever-present threat of worldwide nuclear annihilation. End quote. On the contrary, anarchy is about freedom. Anarcho-capitalism can be defined quite concisely. All the services that governments would provide can be more efficiently, less expensively, and more ethically provided by the free market. This is not about convincing or changing anyone's beliefs here. It is merely to understand politics as a whole by removing the paradigm romantic notions of government, nationalism, and patriotism. To clarify, left anarchists believe in communal ownership and utopian societies of communist and Marxist ideology. This is completely contrary to the belief of a proprietarian anarchist or an anarcho-capitalist. Anarcho-capitalists believe in property. Anarcho-capitalism is completely aligned with libertarian ideology. A true libertarian believes in freedom from all forms of violence, coercion, and manipulation. Libertarian anarchists believe that individuals have the moral justification to themselves, whether that be as the steward of one's body from the Catholic perspective, or as the outright owner. As an extension of one's body is the fruits of their labor and their property. Milton Friedman's son and professor of law at UC Santa Barbara, David Friedman, on private property, quote, one common objection to private property is that it is an immoral system because it relies on selfishness. This is wrong. Most people define selfishness as an attitude of caring only for oneself and considering other people's welfare of no importance. The argument for private property does not depend on people having such an attitude. It depends only on different people having different ends and pursuing them. Each person is selfish only in the sense of accepting and following his own perception of reality, his own vision of the good." End quote. The term anarchy comes from the Greek translation for an, which means without, and archos, which means rulers. Notice how anarchy does not come from the translation for without rules, however. Rights of the individual play a huge role in the pursuit of freedom. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you take Dr. Combs' class, you've probably heard that about 50 times. But where do these rights come from? If you have a society which is made up of humans, you must have a basic understanding of man. Man is responsible for exercising his own will through his consciousness. Unlike other animals, man is able to choose actions freely. Man must apply his will in order to reach his well-being through production, happiness, etc. Man must apply his will in order to reach his well-being through production, oh, excuse me, I said that. Through government intervention, somebody else decides what is morally acceptable and what is not. A short-circuiting of the intellectual process occurs. The nature of humanity becomes undermined. One of the chief attributes of the human being is the ability to think and then act upon your understanding. As these actions become artificially regulated, the human nature of society begins to diminish itself. Some, co some contend that there are no such things as natural rights, and the assertion of rights is an artificial construction used by reactionaries to combat tyrannical government. John Galt, a <coughs> loving character from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, explained, 
The source of man rights is not divine or congressional law, but the law of identity. A is A, man is man. Rights are conditions of existence by man's nature for his proper survival. If a man is to live on earth, it is right for him to use his mind. It is right for him to act on his own free judgment. It is right to work for his values and keep the product of this work. Any group, any gang, any nation that attempts to negate man's rights is wrong, which means is evil, which means is anti-life, anti end quote. The argument can be made that our rights come from either our creator, meaning God, or from our humanity, which is the more secular opinion. Government does not have these rights because it's an artificial temporary establishment. Objective natural laws are found deeply rooted in the very nature of human life. These laws enforce themselves. You drink too much, you get drunk. You uh, work out, your muscles uh, tear. The government is stepping in and artificially constructing laws. It is assuming a right in which it does not have. Furthermore, government is creating society that relies upon it for the formation of reality and character. For example, in today's society, there's an abomination going on. The government deems it moral to abort a fetus in the womb according to its artificially constructed law. I mean, people don't realize how bad this is. I mean, just because the government says that it's legal to eject a fetus from its womb to take it out is now making people think that it's moral. Teenagers coming up in government schools are thinking that this is right. I mean, it's, it's so far fetched to think that the government can create law and create what morality is. Rights, then, are forfeited to the sacred nature of the individual. Judge Andrew Napolitano has spoke time and time again of natural rights and been an ardent defender. Quote, well, please, the mother of God, that the government recognizes um, um, obligations under the natural law. The natural law recognizes that human beings are creatures with an eternal existence because we have souls that don't die. And government is an artificial creation based on force. So which has higher rights? Something that will live forever or something that is artificially and temporarily created? This pillar echoes a, that this is a, this echoes a pillar of the libertarian belief. How can the government exert force on the individual who has not forfeited their rights by violating anyone else's rights? Whether it be the tyranny of a single dictator or the law of a majority elected Barack Obama, both the natural law and natural rights of individuals super, supersede the government. This idea is summarized perfectly in the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 15, 13. Every plant which my heavenly Father has planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Libertarians only see a justification of violence to combat force or the imminent threat thereof. Justification. Religious opponents to libertarianism, such as Robert G. Christian, cite that, quote, libertarianism is centered on the commitment to the autonomy of the individual and removing impediments to the individual's freedom of action. A good way to strengthen the pro-choice side is by framing the debate around autonomy, individual choice, and self-interest, end quote. This is, one of the best, this is one of the best and most frequent arguments I hear as a libertarian again, by Catholics. However, as most anti-libertarian arguments are formed, their shallowness, appear, shallowness appears. Libertarians would never define our philosophy as based in autonomy, individual choice, and self-interest. While it is true that libertarians respect the freedom of choice and individual action over state compulsion, individualism is not the end, and it is not the goal. Libertarianism is based solely in the non-aggression principle. Murray Rothbard defines the non-aggression principle as, no one may threaten or commit violence, aggress, against another man's person or property. Violence may be employed only against the man who committed the violence. That is, only defective against the aggressive violence of another. In short, no violence may be employed against the non-aggressor. How is it the morality of government can be completely suspended when upholding its rule of law? Jesus again reiterates this point. Quote, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except by God's appointment, and the authorities that exist have been appointed by God. However, many state apologists will point, no, excuse me, as Christians, we must focus on the middle sentence of that paragraph, for there is no authority except by God's appointment. This is the focal point in believing in terrestrial legitimate rulers. No authority is legitimate unless appointed by God. However, many state apologists will point to the next point, that authorities that exist have been instituted by God. If we take this notion on its face, that would mean Germans reading this passage in World War II would have to believe Hitler was appointed by God, and Americans today would be forced to believe President Obama is appointed by God. Obviously, through employing rational logic, Jesus is talking about religious authorities in the church and not their secular counterparts. The best argument to be made for the rights of the unborn is a property rights argument, completely in line with the non-aggression principle and libertarian understanding of rights. For example, I want everyone to picture this. 
Fred invites you on their boat, uh, willingly, drives you 90 miles out to sea. During the voyage, your friend changes his mind and decides he no longer wants you on his boat. He now proceeds to throw you overboard, knowing you very well will not be able to survive. Is there no crime of murder being committed here? Wouldn't he first have to make sure you were back on land with, with an ability to continue life before he ejected you from his property? This argument reaches the masses, both religious and secular, with pure logic, and should be employed to stop the genocide of the pro-choice movement. The main tenet of libertarian anarchy is peace. The non-aggression principle is the core of libertarian philosophy. The non-aggression principle asserts that violence is immoral and force may be only asserted in self-defense, defense of others, and defense of property, period. Furthermore, for libertarians, violence is the antithesis of the purpose of the human experience. However, that doesn't mean it isn't likely to occur. If you get drunk, I know you won't punch somebody in the face. <laughs> violence has culminated in the existence of a state. In Politics as a Vocation, famous sociologist Max Weber outlines the definition of the state when he said that something is a state if and insofar as its administrative staff successfully upholds a claim on the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force in the enforcement of its order. This means that the state is the only one who has a legitimate use of violence in society. Anarchists wholly reject this notion. English philosopher Thomas Hobbes believed that the absence of the state, man's nature is evil, and therefore needed a centralized power in order to protect him, in essence, from himself, from himself and from others. Quote, during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in all, they are in the conditions called war, and such a war as if of every man against every man, end quote. Now what is seldom talked about is the assumption Hobbes is making here. If man, by his nature, is evil, and the state is made up of men, would that not by logical reason make the state evil? Adam Smith wrote in Wealth of Nations on man's natural self-interest. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our necessities, but of their advantages. Basically, Smith contends that man is a self-interested being, and that our understanding of man should not play to his morality first, but to the nature of utility. For example, when you walk into a department store, is the clerk going to treat you kindly because of, because of his or her morality, or because you pose a potential benefit? If Smith is correct, and man is a self-interested being, why is it that we expect man in positions of power to drop this notion and act in the service of other men? The state, therefore, would act self-interestedly. Thus, this self-interest can be seen at the root of all evils of government. Furthermore, the state does nothing to prevent a war of, of, war, of prevent a war of all against all. Rather, it perpetuates it. In contrast, the violent nature of government, see Max Weber, institutionalizes violence so omnipresent that we don't question its effectiveness. Hobbes would have us believe that individuals ascend to political dominance by birthright because of the random ge geographical prerogatives of the sovereign. He would have us believe we naturally su surrendered our rights as humans into a social contract so that others would also give up theirs and we would in turn avoid a warlike state in which he believed existed outside government. Quote, from this fundamental law of nature by which man are commanded to endeavor peace is derived the second law, that man be willing when other are to, as far forth as for peace and defense, of himself he shall think it necessary to lay down the right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself, end quote. The state then became the ruler not because of consent, rather because of a contract you did not sign, agree to, or have any part in drafting. The only recourse you would have is to establish, to establish ownership over your own property would be to either sell it or move somewhere else and attempt to change the government that historically has had most of the power, most of the guns, and most of the money. Individually, this hardly seems plausible. How to believe by the maintenance of your property and refusal for relocation meant that you would intrinsically sign this con uh, contract. The notion, that, the notion that my mere presence somewhere indicates my consent is, is highly problematic, both morally and logically. Analogously, this would be like a neighbor dumping law on your trash, uh, excuse me, dumping trash on your lawn. And by, first, and by staying in your house, you are some way consenting to someone littering on your property. The libertarian argument would be that you either are the owner or steward of your body, have ownership rights to it, and of your property. What other institution can make such claims as the one that Hobbes had laid out? The answer, in fact, none. Indeed, the moral codes and philosophies of culture stretching back to the dawn of civilization all include some version of the non-aggression principle. Yet government is the sole exception simply because it has the physical strength to impose itself upon the population. 
This is where Hobbes' impenetrable notion of the invisible contract is seen as unsubstantial. What is, political, what is political science? Arbitrary exceptions are made at the barrel of a gun. Max Weber, like Karl Marx, believes society was based in classes. This notion is often deemed perfectible by many of the neoconservative and neoliberals today. However, this theory is hard to dispute. We are a class-based society, whether it be the haves or the have-nots. For example, those who have cars, those who have not, those who can afford college, and those who cannot. These haves and have-nots are built into any laissez-faire society. Weber's interpretation of classes is very similar to the minarchist conception. A minarchist, however, is someone who believes in small, limited government, which basically could be used for protection, military, security, police, and justice, courts. Thomas Jefferson is the triumph of the those who believe fervently in states' rights and the decentralization of power. Jefferson saw government, as many of the other founders did, as fire that needed to be controlled and limited to its least extent. Jefferson is known for his work in drafting the Declaration of Independence, being a staunch classical liberal, and in instituting many of the values and beliefs we see in American society today. What many people don't know is that Jefferson himself believed that the founders had done an ill-sufficient job at securing the freedom the revolutionaries had fought so hard for. Jefferson penned a series of letters in which he stated his newfound belief that the American Republic was dead. Letter to John Holmes, April 22, 1820. I regret that I am now to die in the belief that you were sacrificed for themselves by the generation of 1776 who acquired self-government and happiness for their country is to be thrown away by the unwise and unworthy passions of their time, and that my only consolation is to be that I live not to weep over. Letter to Samuel Macon, 1821. Our government is now taking so steady a course as to show by what road it will pass to destruction. That is, by consolidation first, and then corruption, its necessary consequence. Sound familiar? Letter to John Cartwright, June 5th, 1824. Our revolution presented us an album on which we were to write what we pleased, yet we did not avail, avail ourselves of all the advantages of our position. He speaks, he goes on to speak about political parties and how they're gonna be the death of society. Um, George Washington, John Adams, both be wealthies. Letter to, letter to William B. Giles, 1825. I see the deepest affliction, the rapid strides with which the federal branch of our government is advancing towards the usurpation of all the rights reserved to the states and the consolidation in itself of all powers, foreign and domestic, and that too by constructions which, if legitimate, leaves no limit to their power. How is it that a Jeffersonian defender of the modern republic can read the letters of Jefferson and in any way determine that he would endorse the government that we are faced with today? This is where anarchists diverge from modern political philosophy suppositions. Anarchists believe it is neither necessary nor legitimate for anyone to force, manipulate, or coerce anyone, including and especially government. Furthermore, libertarians think government, limited government, is a utopian way of thinking. Famous individualist anarchist Benjamin Tucker, who called his movement unterrified Jeffersonianism, explains, if li limited government is good, the perfection of government is no government. It is here we see that government has never been limited in the history of the world. Even in our own times, the limited government we were, we were founded on is becoming more and more imperialistic, socialistic, and militaristic, starting a world police crusade and taxing its citizens to pay for everything from cell phones to health care. Anything that the government can offer the public is a strand of socialism, no matter how it is looked at. For example, public education is educational so socialism, taking from some and for taking forcibly from some and giving to others, giving education to others. State apologists will have you believe that, the that, that people are the government. Following this logic, uh, whatever the government does then becomes legitimate and voluntary. The government has incurred a huge public debt which must be paid by taxing one group for the benefit of another. This reality of burden is obscured by saying, we owe it to ourselves. Any Jews murdered by the Nazi government were not murdered, instead they committed suicide. We must therefore emphasize that we are not the government, and the government is not us. Limited government seekers believe that the problem is fixable. That government can become our servant once again, not our master. In many instances, this thing that they want to create and call a limited government has absolutely no relationship and none of the essential characteristics of any government ever on the face of the earth. Generally, these models have no power to tax and no absolute jurisdiction over a given territory. Without these essential powers, there is no government. Even Samuel Adams, another one of our great founding fathers, believed philosophically in the nature of man as being free from government control when he said in the rights of colonists on November 20, 1772, quote, the natural liberty of man is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the will of or legislative authority of man, but only to have the law of nature for his rule, end quote. 
This is where libertarians of the voluntarist tradition, everything should be voluntary, uh, break from the libertarian, mainstream libertarian likes of Rand Paul, or even of Jeffordists like Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand. When the state has a monopoly on force, it is historically accurate to say monopoly leads to construction, uh, excuse me, corruption, violence, and death on a scale of epic proportion. Even in our own American experience, we are sold and indoctrinated with the ideas of limited government, separation of powers, and checks and balances. But as noted by Murray Rothbard, these devices can, quote, scarcely be considered restraining devices at all. Every one of these institutions is an agency of the central government. If we objectively look at the separation of powers, we see that they are not so separate after all. This is in due large part to the fact that both the executive and legislative branches maintain significant control over the viewpoint of the judicial branch. Therefore, the judiciary is an indirect product of the majority. Rothbard states again, this means that the state has set itself up as a judge of its own cause, that is thus violating a basic jur juridical principle for aiming at just decisions. The president, is the product of the majority. The congressmen and senators are products of the majority. The, the courts are selected by the majority's agents. What legal recourse is open to the citizen when the majority becomes corrupt? Government always grows. That is embedded into its very nature. Government is a power agent and a tool for creating privilege. It must constantly take on new functions in order to maintain its health. In democracy, we are often told it is our duty to vote for our leaders and subsequently for the laws that will regulate society. However, if we delve deeper into the meaning of the democratic process, we are privy to the idea that voting itself is essentially immoral. Every time we take a trip to the voting booth, we are attempting to exercise majority rule over, over a minority population. Another example of, this, of, of, of the illustration of this is the absurdity of community influence violent thinking laid out by Robert Lefebvre. A peaceful and law-abiding citizen, for example, may have perfectly sound and moral reasons why he wished not to share his money with the government or politicians of Yugoslavia. His conviction can be logically derived, morally certain, and sincerely, sincerely maintained. In holding to his conviction, the individual is harming no one. His belief is not inimical to the welfare of other people. Actions which might spring from his belief are not aggressive. In other words, physically, mentally, and morally, such a citizen can be above reproach. Yet when the government adopts a policy, which prescribes the sharing of his earnings with a foreign government. The man who objects to this can be treated precisely the same manner as a bank robber could be treated, and for the same reason. The government cannot brook a deviationist. The precedent factor set by many of the government functions is completely inadequate in legitimizing itself and its actions. Two types of mass-issued violence can be observed when looking through the lens of a, through the lens of a government dissenter, such as myself. The first is democide, which is a term coined by political scientist R.J. Rummel as the murder of any person or people by their government, including genocide, politicide, and mass murder. The figure cal calculates to be around 262 million people killed by their own government in the last century alone. During the 20th century, over 200 million men, women, and children have been shot, beaten, tortured, knived, burned, starved, frozen, crushed, and worked to death, buried alive, drowned, hung, bombed, or killed in any of the other myriad of ways Governments have inflicted death on unarmed, helpless citizens and foreigners. Over 40 million of them alone have been killed by war, also in just the last century alone. This is due mainly to the centralization of power and control in government structures in the hands of self-interested and corrupted leaders. Law does not constrain government. As Martin Luther King eloquently explained, never forget that everything Hitler did in Nazi Germany was legal. The libertarian perspective on the state and its under, undermining factors does not, however, end with a call for, for anarchy. It instead begins. Now, there are a myriad of non-essential solutions in an anarchist society. We will look at free market capitalism as an alternative to government service. In order to understand the free market, we must look at Austrian economic theory the origin of Austrian economics is believed to have begun in the 15th century by followers of St. Thomas Aquinas in Spain, but was pushed forward by Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek in Austria, hence the name Austrian economics. The goal was to explain human action and social organizations. Freedom to contract and property rights were put at the forefront of the theory. Capitalism posits a society based in self-ownership and cannot exist in a state-like atmosphere. Private self-ownership and ownership of private property makes free market capitalism incompatible with government. Austrian economics' central concept is that the coordination of human effort can 
be achieved only through the combined decisions and judgments of individuals and cannot be forced by any ex external agency, such as the government. It emphasizes complete freedom of association and sovereignty of individual property rights. In his book, Economics in One Lesson, Henry Hazlitt ex explains the difference between good and bad economics. As a prescriber of the Austrian school, Hazlitt shows how Austrians are superior in their study because of a better understanding of how the world works. The bad economist sees only what immediately strikes the eye. The good economist also looks beyond. The bad economist sees only the direct consequences of a proposed course. The good econ economist also looks at the longer and indirect consequences. The bad economist sees what the effect of a given policy has or will be on one particular group. The good economist inquires on what the effect of the policy will be on all groups. Human reason is at the basic basis of economics. Throughout history, in order to control men and employ the state as a central planner, human reason had to be discounted, it had to be undermined. Karl Marx went so far as to conclude that human reason was unequipped to find any sort of truth. Logic was seen to be fabricated. Everything that the mind thinks of is, seerly, is, is um, merely subjective ideology. However, Marx believed that the theory of which he posited was hypocritically absolute truth. This assumption becomes highly problematic when following his train of thinking. In Human Action, Ludwig von Mises lays out the Austrian idea of the free market system. The market economy is the social system and the, of the division of labor under private ownership of the means of production. Everybody acts on his own behalf, but everybody's actions aim at the satisfaction of other people's needs as well as the satisfaction of his own. Everybody in acting serves his fellow citizens. Everybody, on the other hand, is also served by his fellow citizens. Everybody is both a means and an end in himself an ultimate end for himself, and a means to other people in their endeavors to achieve their ends. Each is part of the not by the second, secondary power of morality and ethics, rather by the activities of men pursuing their own interests, which is uh, mentioned previously as inherent in their nature and completely in accordance with reality. This free market, then, is not a tangible thing, rather it's a process by which humans interact and choose to direct their capital. Anarcho capitalism the reason found in Mises' next statement. The market economy must be strictly differentiated from the second thinkable, although not realizable, system of social cooperation under the division of labor. The system of social or government ownership of the means of production. This second system is commonly called socialism, communism, planned economy, or state capitalism. The market economy or capitalism, as it's usually called, and the social economy preclude one another. There is no mixture of the two systems, possible or thinkable. There is no such thing as a mixed economy, a system that could be in part capitalist and in part socialist. Production is directed by the market or by the decrees of the production czar or a committee of the produ of production czars. The popular economic ideas that have been sprinkled throughout the history of the U.S. come from the ideology of John Maynard Keynes. Has anyone heard of Keynesian economics before? <laughs> the, a lot of people, you'd be surprised, a lot of people have never heard of it. The idea behind Keynesian economics is that an economy requires control from government in order to increase spending, in order to subsequently increase earnings. His call for an interventionist, meaning government intervenes, economic policy was in response to the crash of the stock market of 1929. Keynes is usually falsely credited with the revival of the economy after the crash. This is, you, this is confused historically with the start of World War II and the amount of capital that was pumped into the market through massive defense spending. Keynesian economics is a complete break from laissez-faire capitalism as it advocates for massive public sector planning and intervention into the market. Keynesian economics supports the radical redistribution of wealth by the government. The macroeconomic level is, is credited with being, uh, being able to solve the problems on the microeconomic level. Analogously, problems with an individual can be solved through focusing on the community. See Marcus, Marxist socialism. A great example of the fallacy of Keynesian economics is laid out by Hazlitt in Economics in One Lesson, which he calls the broken window fallacy. As proposes a situation, everyone can picture this, in which a hoodlum throws a brick uh, through a shopkeeper's window. People begin to gather to admire the destruction of what just happened. The shopkeeper is distraught, but the people remind him that he should be happy because he just created business for, for, uh, for a glazier, for somebody that makes glass. If windows were never broken, the question arises, where arises what would happen to the glass business? The hoodlum has performed an special function in his society. <laughs> Because the glazier will now become richer, spend his newly acquired money, and put his money into the economy. Government is this hoodlum. In Keynesian economics, the hoodlum has gone from a private menace to a public benefactor. A simplified e explanation of the efficiency and real-world capability of Austrian economics was clarified greatly 
through the analogy made by Milton Friedman in his analogy of the pencil. The basic premise behind this idea explains how sound economics truly works. For example, imagine a pencil. First, consider what this pencil is made of. Its components include wood, rubber, graphite, metal. Where does this wood come from? The wood was harvested in the forests of Oregon. The metal is made from steel mills and timber. The eraser comes from rubber trees in Panama. The graphite is condensed in a factory in France. How is it the wood is cut from, cut from the forest? The company uses an electric saw to cut down the trees. These saws are made from iron ore. This iron ore comes from caves in Africa. The wood is then loaded into trucks and or planes. Well, what makes these trucks? Well, how are these planes produced? The great focus of nature of the market comes to fruition in this example of the pencil. The people that are responsible for the production of the rubber, wood, metal, and graphite come from different religions, come from different race, cultures, backgrounds. However, the market brings them all together, together to achieve the common goal of capital. The invisible hand doctrine laid out by Adam Smith embodies the market in what has just occurred. There was no need for a federal pencil observatory board. Central planning historically has led to inefficiency and waste as the free market has pulled people out of poverty better than any government or central planning device ever could in the history of the world. Anarcho-capitalists argue that the same model could and should be applied to defense services, arbitration, and military. It is here I'm going to switch over now to talk about um, just that, police, military, and courts in an anarchist society. First, let us think of a free market solution to privatize police. Governments monopolistic, uh, monopolies inefficient and downright uneconomical in basically every area, from running the post office to the DMV to the healthcare system. I don't know if anyone's ever been to the DMV, but it's horrible. Why is it that conservatives and libertarians alike agree with Ludwig von Mises' assumption that the democracy of the market consists in the fact that people themselves make their choices? and that no dictator has the power to force them to submit to his value judgments. Yet they are unwilling to search for market alternatives and accept the fallacy that big brother, big brother government is ultimately necessary. This is why anarcho-capitalists, as lovers of freedom, love the free market. It's about incentives and the choices that correspond. We vote with our dollars, and changes are able to be made instantaneously. If a company like Blockbuster no longer serves our interests, and its products become outdated and inefficient, we are able to take away our votes in the symbol of money. The flip side is that we have a comp company like Apple that offers superior productization and technological advances that serve us most beneficially, we are able to vote for them by giving them our business. Imagine if we were forced in 2015 to use VHS only because the government forced it upon us and made it our only option. Why is this model of the free, um, uninhibited market proven as superior in every aspect of life but is deemed unreasonable, radical, and extremist in the realms of defense protection? Libertarians agree that aggression will always be found in the marketplace, and imperfections are writ large in the human life. This means there is a market incentive for protection from aggressors, the same way there is a market protection for defense against rain. The market, however, will provide you with choices. Choices inspire competition. Competition inspires quality. In our current monopolistic system, we have no choices. For example, if the police department in Chicago is seen as outdated and inefficient, or worse, as corrupt, the consumers of the service have nowhere to turn except to the politicians who are writing the corrupt and outdated laws that the police are enforcing. It is a truly incestuous relationship, and the incentives are not seen for the police to improve their product. In a free society, if a number of people fear the act of aggression, there will be an incentive for a defense agency to arise in the market. The agency will be accountable to their customers because they rely on these customers for their contributions to stay in business. The company begins to act outside of its means in the form of inefficient or corrupt service. People can vote them down by removing their dollars immediately rather than wait four years and hoping majority of people agree. Contemporary policing is based upon forced taxation, and therefore its survival is not dependent upon the quality of its service. Police agencies in the free market system would also contrarily derive their compensation from not only their customers, but those who keep them in existence, namely criminals. In such a society, law is produced on the market. The court supports itself by charging for the service of arbitrating disputes. Its success depends on the reputation for honesty, reliability, and promptness and on the desirability to potential customers of the particular set of laws it judges by. The immediate customers are the protection agencies, but the protection agency itself is, is selling the product to its customers. Part of that product is the legal system or systems of the courts it patronizes and under which its customers will consequently be judged. Each protection agency will try to patronize those courts under whose legal, legal system its customers prefer. <coughs> now it knows a lot of questions. Protection, efficiency, quality will be at the forefront of the agency survived. Like is the case in the business world, mergers may take place.
rights. For example, a successful de defense agency may uh, merge with a successful arbitration service, the same way McDonald's merged with Chipotle. The main argument against free market law is the proposed inability to agree on a court. For example, a murderer would prefer a more merciful judge. The market, however, would most likely dictate for a contractual system, the same way the auto insurance market, uh, market uh, dictates that now, chosen in advance by these defense agencies. It is juvenile to think that in a free society there would be enough murderers who would band together and be able to afford a defense agency that caters solely to their wishes, and furthermore, for there be an agency to find arbitration service that agrees with their premise that murder is not a crime. The murderer would then be forced to either submit to the decisions of the market or fight a suicidal war against the rest of the given society. Another objection to the free market arbitration is that courts would favor the wealthiest person in that case. Looking deeper into this argument, we see that a market would never allow for a court that was dishonest to be attractive to customers. Subsequently, the market would dictate this court to go out of business. David Friedman explains, several objections may be raised to such free market courts. The first is that they would sell justice by deciding in favor of the highest bidder. This would be suicidal. Unless they maintained a re reputation for honesty, they would have no customers, unlike our present judges. If the laws are not obvious, however, the market will have an incentive for research to discover what the law actually is, the same way architects, architects attempt to decipher the law of physics. What about the poor who can't afford it? Another objection to the free market defense is the issue of costs. Again, we have to look at uh, we have to look for incentives. Would it be easier for a defense company to protect a customer in Fallujah or in Connecticut? Obviously, the latter. The latter. Why? Because it's going to be expensive to protect a customer in a warlike criminal zone rather than in a place that has stable conditions. There would be an incentive to keep crime low in all areas. Also, the company could receive just compensation from the aggressor and crime committer rather than just the customer. However, unlike today, the defense agency would be held to high standards of accountability to make sure they are operating justly and within their bounds. An example to refute the objection to the, uh, an example to refute the objection to the poor will be in chaos is what's happening now with a private defense firm headquartered in Tampa, Florida in which a man realized the public housing projects were being not adequately policed. He started a firm with a $2,000 loan from his father and offered various landlords a service of protecting uh, their buildings and their tenants. The landlords found this to be a great deal because it had all sorts of economic incentives, reduced turnover rates, reduced vandalism, safer environments, less crime, etc. The tenants also obviously benefited dramatically. This man expanded his firm to several cities and is now providing an example of private incentives beating monopolized service. Furthermore, liability becomes much more into play for police in the private sector because suing the public sector is very difficult nowadays. Another objection of private law is that it would be too confusing, that the standards would be all over the place. David Friedman explains, if this is found to be a serious problem, courts will have an economic incentive to adopt uniform law, just as paper companies have incentive to produce standardized pieces of paper. New law will be introduced only when the innovator believes that its advantages outweigh the advantages of uniformity. So again, a misunderstanding of how the market looks leads people to rely on big, market, big brother government. The arguments for government-derived law and laws, law enforcement over market alternatives are shallow. Law and law enforcement, including criminal law, has historically, at one time or another, been handled by the private sector. Government law and its enforcement are sold as public goods. However, this notion is a fallacy. The notion of the public goods maintain that these services are equally accessible and, impossibility, and the impossibility of a better quality alternative in the private sector. The notion encompasses equal access to law, law enforcement, adjudication, and prosecution. However, the majority of crimes reported to, re to police are never resolved. An FBI study done in 2006 concluded that 44.3% of violent crimes and 15.8% of property crimes were resolved by arrest or exceptional means. Of the violent crimes, murder and non negligent manslaughter, forcible rape, robbery, and aggravated assault, murder had the highest percentage of offenses cleared at 60%. That's still 40% of, of murder cases that go unsolved. Of the property crimes, burglary, larceny, theft, and motor vehicle theft, motor vehicle theft, larceny theft had the highest percentage of offenses cleared at 17.4%. That's over 80% of cases never solved. Another scenario would be something that like that is happening today in the abominable city of Detroit. The Detroit Threat Management Center started in 1995 to combat the high risk of murder and home invasions that have been occurring. That accompanied with the rapid, rampant corruption in the police department led to the formation of a private defense company. An excerpt from their website, they are called the Detroit Threat Management Center. An excerpt from their website reads, in 1995, on the east side of Detroit, Commander Brown officially, void, uh, officially formed the Vipers, Violence Inter Intervention Protective Emergency Response System, a bodyguard tactical training program that emphasizes the importance 
of mission-motivated, altruistic community service. The organization became known for helping the community by stopping home invasions and murders that had been pro problems for many years prior. This resulted in a good quality of life for the residents who lived in the community. The byproduct of which meant that the building owners, owners went into the black for the first time in 20 years, and guess who got the credit? The police. They received 90% of the, uh, they received all the accolades for a 90% reduction in violent crime and 911 calls. Their protection agency has only since become better and more efficient. And here's the kicker. They've never accepted a dollar of public funds and have never had an officer arrested or sued. This is contingent upon the fact that there is an incentive to hire officers who are not prone to violence. Commander Dale Brown of the Detroit Threat Management Center explains, we constantly recruit. We are a performance-based organization. The foundation for its success, the individuals that are a part of our organization are required to be altruistic. The lifeblood of our organization is having people who, that are really talented, really motivated, and highly skilled by constantly training them. Those people who are not good enough do not or do not want to train are replaced by better people. We are, look, we are not looking, nor do we accept, people who are human predator oriented. For example, people who like to fight or people who like to shoot people. A lot of times guys come back from the military and I have to be careful because I'm not looking for the kind of mindset that says it's okay to use violence as long as you can legally explain it. We're looking for people who don't want to use violence under any condition. We emphasize a hundred ways in a situation that would usually be fatal force oriented. A hundred ways to not have a violent or fatal incident take place. The service, this service, is provided to the community completely free. Why? Because the incentives for the businesses to protect their communities and their customers was evident. They are financed by the businesses in the area as well as, as uh, a few wealthy clientele. And even though because of the government interference in the market, they are not allowed to seek restitution from criminals, they still do a terrific job of serving the impoverished communities of one of the worst cities in the United States. Their website gives a great explanation of their history, testimonials, and information on how to get involved in your community. In addition to this, we have to look at history. People assume that government-supplied law enforcement is the way it's always been. The, the first public police force wasn't created until the 1840s. Most policing was done beforehand at the community level. The reason for shifting from private sector to public sector was about money. The government saw an incentive to get its hand in the civil and criminal conviction and restitution. In his book, The Enterprise of Law, Justice Without the State, Florida State Professor of Economics, Bruce Benson, gives a short history of how public police got its start. After the first true public police force was established in New York in 1844, other cities followed suit shortly. From the outset, however, these police departments were not were used, were used for political purposes. Crime control was at best a secondary concern. First of all, local officials used their police departments as a way to award political supporters. A newly elected mayor typically fired the entire police department and replaced it with his own supporters. Bribery was often necessary to obtain position on the police force, and, the pre and, the pra and that practice was financially reasonable, giving the potential payoff for police corruption. At any rate, mayors and their political machines that use police departments to control the city for their own benefit. Most big city police departments were started as private defense companies, from San Francisco all the way to Boston. The government then cajoled them into becoming government service in order to very carry out laws that were passed. For example, the Pinkertons were a private defense company that operated nationwide. They were known for their superiority, innovation, and efficiency. The government took note, basically forced them to work as a government agency. The Pinkertons are now known as the Secret Service. Libertarians realized the world is not going to be perfect. There will always be problems in the marketplace. However, competition will provide better service than the monopolization 100% of the time. Even if you are still not convinced, I have this last week from independent.org, which seeks alternatives to monopolization. It is important to mention that even though a market may fail to provide optimal results, government intervention will not necessarily improve the situation. Suboptimal uh, private position will be, still be superior to the public position, which often involves inefficiency and other problems. Public provision normally entails a government monopoly that has a not-for-profit, for example, not operating as a profit center, but is still susceptible to bureaucratic and political pressure. Newspapers are riddled with stories of police corruption and brutality, even though there are three times as many private security personnel than government police. What if a bad police agency arose? Wouldn't they just take over by disregarding the rules that other people had set up in society? Robert Murphy makes a great point by espousing, we must consider that in such an environment, environment the law-abiding majority would have all sorts of mechanisms at their disposal beyond physical uh, confrontation. Uh, once private judges had ruled against a particular rogue agency, the private banks could freeze its assets. In addition, the private utility companies could shut down the electricity and water to the agency's headquarters in accordance with standard provisions in their contracts. 
What if different people disagree on what the law should be? What if some people believe a abortion is just and others think it is murder? Employing my argument from before, I don't see a real argument in, in favor of abortion. People think heroin should be allowed, and others people, people think it should. It, it should. Well, what happens currently? If people believe abortion is murder, people still act civilized enough to respect the law and act civilly in their disagreements. If they can act civil enough by going to a voting booth to change rules, what makes you think that change in a market? Um, what makes you think this is going to change in a market where opinions are truly going to be heard? What happens when the criminal is ap apprehended for a crime? Prisons will then be replaced with re restitution companies. To better understand what that means, let's look at an extreme specific example. A person kills a uh, father of three children. He's apprehended and convicted of murder by a defense company. Obviously, return to the status quo is not possible. The goal of the court is to now uh, recompense the family to the greatest extent possible. In a murder crime, the debt cannot be paid back to the victim. However, it can be paid back to their estate. There are two alternatives the murderer can choose. One, he will work to pay back the family for the loss of life and all the victim's possible debt. Uh, and he will keep only a portion to sustain his own life. The second option is to seek a restitution firm that will offer money to the victim's estate. What we see here is the victim's estate deciding either to take your money over time or to take it all at once at an agreed upon amount by the court. If the, if the estate chooses the court, the murder is now the property of the restitution firm. The most constructive manner in which to come to a correct compensation is through the market. If the victim doesn't have family or loved ones in which he is left to his estate in the will, the property now becomes the property of the agency that captured it and put away the murderer. This rest restitution firm or private prison will employ its inhabitants to a labor force comprised of criminals and delinquents. Stereotypically, these inhabitants will only be suited for labor at sub-market pay, <coughs> mainly because there's going to be a cost to keep the workers restrained. There would be an incentive for rehabilitation of the criminals as well. If the prisoner shows behavioral improvement, the company can decide to give the prisoner a bigger job or work in an area with less control. If earning a high wage, the criminal will pay his debt more quickly. There is now an incentive on the part of the criminal to act better. Today's prison system does nothing to rehabilitate criminals. Rather, it locks them up for years at the taxpayer's taxpayers' expense. Furthermore, most of the crimes in which they are locked up in an unstable and criminal environment are victimless. A free market prison system would find incentives to rehabilitate criminals to make more money. If a prisoner showed contempt for life and did not wish to work, the prison would find it in their best interest to find some sort of physical or mental rehabilitation. The market prison system, like all other market systems, is not perfect. However, the public prison system is another example of the public sector being outdated, inefficient, and counterproductive to the free market alternative. Following suit, the final call to the minarchist call for government intervention is to provide a national military. How could a free society uh, protect themselves from either organized crime or invading nations? I agree, this is one of the most important questions for anarcho-capitalists to answer. To preface this argument, let's look at first what would happen upon the dissolution United States government. If a libertarian movement is to take place that subsequently ended the idea of having government here, chances are that these ideas would spread rapidly throughout the world, especially with the advent of the internet and through social media. Countries that hate the U.S. intervention in their country or neighboring states would no longer have a reason to hate or fear the gargantuan U.S. states. Neo-conservative movements would be the of our day, often known as the by the Fourth Amendment, the Second Amendment, and the take over their tax base. If you control a relatively small centralized group of leaders, you control the entire country. However, a libertarian society would not have a government, nor a tax base. Instead, the foreign invader onto the North American continent would have to, quote, be forced to deal with millions of armed households, thousands of industries, and a myriad of technological defense companies or other organized forms of mutual protection and defense. If a demand for defense, defense arose, even if it arose quickly, a market would respond, especially in the absence that is inherent in the government of the decision-making apparatus. It is highly likely that the market defense mechanism that would be both prepared for and response to any threat would function far more effectively than any government defense bureaucracy, end quote. If the defense agencies mentioned previously are not big enough, or not adequately enough funded to defend against an invader of hundreds or more thousands, there is a tremendous market possibility that insurance companies that provide defense services on a much bigger scale will arise. In a free market society, 
people would be able to buy insurance in case of an attack, and they will be covered. The financial incentive to stop the tax before they take place would be tantamount, as they would have they would be able to avoid larger financial losses that could result. The invader will not only be dealing with a singular opposing state, rather will have to fight against defense operations that come from a multitude of different areas of life. Libertarians will also have the ability to seek the most efficient defense method, rather than wait for the policy of the country to change. Neoconservatives love to bemoan the fact that our military is usually not employed enough by the government. Quote, the conservatives advocate for the free market. But on the important issue of defense, the conservative advocates was effectively a socialist, fascist view of the state as being the exclusive provider. This is a curiosity, and again, contradiction to the intellectual integrity of the conservative party. A lack of clarity does not burden the libertar libertarian. Historically in war, government has been the initiator and the people and been the initiator, and the people have been the participant. To advocate for the government to protect against war is highly problematic then, seeing how it has usually been the cause. Another main problem with this train of thought is laid out by Tannehill in Market for Liberty. Quote, to maintain that government is necessary to defend society from foreign aggression is to maintain that it is necessary to use domestic aggression against the citizen in order to protect him from foreign aggression. Even if there was a case for people not being able to afford it, the insurance company would still find an incentive to cover them with little or no cost to the company. This is due mainly to the fact that the insurance company is first being paid and then outsourcing by paying a private defense contractor. So they would not be taking a direct hit. Insurance company equity levels today can relinquish, can relinquish 20% without having any sort of solvency problems. The current equity level surplus in the, in, in the insurance industry is $347 billion. That means that a company can lose up to $69 billion at any time and not experience any type of solvency problems. The Iraq war only cost $262 billion, so it would not be a question of the money being there. In addition, no insurance company places itself only in one area. It is their nature to compete in many geographical areas. So if an invading state attacks, they would not be only attacking one insurance company, but their competing insurance companies, private defense agencies, and private, defense, uh, private citizens' resistance movements. This is a huge advantage that the anarchist society would have. If the anarchist society is dealing with an invading state and the state was able to gain control, the insurance company would, would be subject to sanctions, taxes, or any restrictions that the state put, up, put in. So even if the uh, uh, state that was invading tried to negotiate with the company, and try to buy them out beforehand, um, there would be an incentive to not do it because historically states renege on their deals um, and can seldom be trusted. For example, when the income tax started in 1914, the top 1% were up in arms because they had to pay 7% of taxes. Four years later, they had to pay 77%. Even in areas where there are few customers, if the company doesn't provide adequately, adequately for them, so say like um, the middle of Montana, there's not a lot of customers there, there might be one or two, but the, the insurance company decides, oh, well, we don't want to provide for them. Um, they are going to be proved to be unreliable throughout the, throughout the country. I mean, throughout social media now, we see it, and sh how we're able to learn about companies and the, the ills that they bring about. Um, insurers may, in other areas, may choose to go with other companies. Warfare, as is proposed in American society today, would not be a warfare in a free society because it does not make economic sense. Private agencies would use their assets more resourcefully because they own the military assets. Whereas politicians, especially in democracies, merely exercise short-term control over the state's military equipment. In conclusion, anarcho-capitalist society would allow the individual to freely attempt to maximize his own satisfaction, given the nature of the exchange taking place in the market. It allows for, uh, participants to benef uh, benefit from one another's achievements, and, and, for, and most fortuitously. Think about the growth and the opportunities of free society will provide for safety and security and the advantages that, advantages that can be made in technology without government restrictions. Think about how police will be incentivized to operate of the people, by the people, and for the people. Think about the incentives for businesses who are not paying a dime in taxes to want to pay defense agencies to protect their stores and their customers. Think about the incentives for landlords to provide defense agencies at a fraction of the cost of their residents because the attractiveness it now, attractiveness it now brings to their properties. Think about the incentives insurance companies would have for rewarding good parenting and safe behavior. Think about the incentives for private prisons that keep and retain prisoners that would be productive and rehabilitated. Think about the advan uh, advancements and achievements that take place by more aptly focusing a private military to direct threats and causes people, people are willing to pay for. And even if, society, even if the society I have described is not what you are looking for, you will still be entered to able into, entered able into whatever government you want to be led by and take care of you. However, every individual has the right to secession. The founders believe we enter into government with our consent.
because there is no other choice for defense or security. If a free market society provides a better, a better choice, the individual has the right to enter into it. The voluntary arrangements of a private, set, a private property society would be far more conducive to peace, freedom, and the rule of law than a coercive setup of a parasitical monopoly government. I think um, on the term of liberty and, and, and on freedom, I think Archbishop Fulton Sheen summed up the best when he said, quote, take the quality of freedom away from anyone and it is no more possible for him to be virtuous than it is for a blade of grass uh, which treads beneath the, his feet. Take freedom away from life and there would be no reason to honor the fortitude of martyrs than there would be to honor the flames which kindle their faggots. It is therefore any impeachment of, is it, is it therefore any impeachment of God that he chose not to reign over an empire of chemicals? Virtue in its concrete order is possible only in the spheres in which it is possible to be vicious. Man can be a saint only in a world in which it is possible to be a devil. Government is a shadow on the wall of the cave, posed to us to be necessary and true. It is time for us to remove the shackles, dust ourselves off, and enter the light. The revolution begins now. Right. right. 
in, in property <laughs> rights, in property rights, you have right. To, I mean, in yeah. the non-aggression principle, excuse me, yeah. in the non-aggression principle, you have the right to yourself and your property. Right. So that's where that would, I think. So, he, so he, owns his, he owns his flammables. No, he owns his flammables. Right. But the person that owns the bus also owns the bus. He also owns the bus. Right. And if he doesn't want that behavior on his property, he has every moral and ethical right to remove that person from his property. Because I don't think a bus company would want somebody on their bus with flammables, and that would the, the customers would okay. want to ride and that bus. He says, "I'm not leaving." Oh, well, then you have a private defense company that the company's paying for it that would come in the same so way. Somebody, somebody is coming and using aggression. Then he hasn't. But the point is, is that you're going to be employing aggression against somebody who himself is non-aggressive. That's my point. Well, I understand. I understand. Okay. His aggr my argument, my only argument, would be that his aggression right. was by being on my property without my consent. Yeah, you'd be violating. You'd be violating the property rights of the of the owner of the bus company. Okay, then, but of course, you, what we're going to get in is then disagreements among people about these terms, right? And so you're going to have the property owner. Now, too, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, 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 the only thing I'm pointing at number one, you're going to get to difficulties in terms of aggression. Because force is going to need to be used. Yes. We live in a world in which force is sometimes going to be used in relationships. So, non aggression in and of itself is a pipe dream. Because force is a fact of life, yes? I would say no, it's not a pipe dream. I would say because okay. the, I would, my last point was that the non aggression principle right. ha, it allows for your. Um, you're, you're saying it's a legitimate use of force. Exactly. Okay, right. exactly. Right. Right. There can be a legitimate use of force. Exactly. Excellent. Right. Okay. So, uh, a big two questions here. Right. Let's go now and this idea of non aggression. Okay, it's based upon a philosophy as it necessarily must. It has a superficial appeal, like ideas like liberty or equality or fraternity, right. all have, and non-aggression is essentially saying to us that everyone um, has uh, this obligation not to aggress against somebody else. Although we can, if you violate the terms of our contract, we can aggress. So there's this, just like, you know, there's always, obviously we, we now have qualifiers, even to the non-aggression. Okay, well, it's based in part upon an assumption about the value of the human person. Yes? It's based in part, where are we going to get this assumption about right. the value of the human person? Okay, well, let's assume that what you have is a worldview in which you don't value the human person. Okay, let's assume that we have a worldview in which, let's say, that you have a perception in which God is so great okay. and we are so insignificant that if you are acting in a way that is displeasing to God, then the ultimate truth is not that you have value, but that you are acting in a way that is displeasing to you. What you have is a, a fundamental difference in terms of your founding principles. Right. So they're not going to agree with your non-aggression Like principles. the Puritans, like if you had a Puritan society, this would be right. very hard or, to or, or fundamental Islam. Right, okay. okay. Now, so you never you think you can convince these people that this is universal, and it, then can we take it to a Confucius culture, which Confucianism, for instance, where they don't have a lot of value for the respect of the human person. There's they put put a higher premium upon order. So my question is, is is this going to translate outside of a Western culture? So go ahead. So your question yeah. to me was, could an anarchist society function in the Islamic world or in a place like the Middle East? It, it, could it be truly universal and that everybody's going to come to accept what you're saying? Okay. Well, my counter question to you would be... No, no, I'm asking you the question. Well, right, but it, it's going to... This premise it would be, would, do you think democracy would work? Uh, no, not situation. necessarily. I'm not, I'm not saying that... It, I don't believe that you can take one principle and the solution for the entire world. Right, I mean, but this, that, my, thesis was on, my thesis was on taking the founding principles, natural rights, freedom, Put and, and going to the purest form that they, that they were okay, envisioned. That's fine. No, but what I'm, what I'm taking your project to be is that you're taking one, pro, one principle, non aggression, and trying to deduce from that an entire worldview in terms of how we are to engage in social order. Ethically, ethically. Ethically. Ethically, I mean, you can, you can argue one way or the other whether, whether it would work or not, but ethically, I think the non aggression principle. Um, you want me to read the definition in full one more time? Just so. No, it, it's okay. I just I, I got the okay. idea. My my point is simply, would everybody accept it? No, no. Okay. No, 
Uh, not only that, I mean, we have to, I mean, the same way we try to spread democracy around the world, people aren't going to just accept it just because we say it. We have to work through different types of um, conditions and social media and the internet now, and people are starting to come around to the ideas of freedom and equality that they've never heard before. They've heard that. So you think if only, they, if only you could teach them, they would take your life? Well, I think the proof is in the pudding. Okay. I think that you don't have to sell the product. Um, that's good. I think it sells itself. So, I mean, I, I, was, I was at um, a talk the other day by C.W. Cook, and he gave a, a talk on the Conservatory Manifesto, and he talked about states' rights. He was talking about states' rights, going back to states' rights. And he said that people in Massachusetts will see, if we went back to states' rights, that Texas is better because it will operate better, because it will... I, I think that's the same thing with, with, with the principles I'm putting out to you guys, is that I think that the proof will be in the pudding, and people will see through action that it works. Okay. So we have to have such a society first, which has been... Of course. Of course. Yeah. Contractor, but what happens when one defense contractor has a whole lot more guns than the other defense contractor? Doesn't that just become sort of a de facto government, perhaps, or is it the onus no. put on him to on that defense contractor to just be chill and not crush the competition immediately? Where where is this defense contractor getting its money from? It's getting its money from its customers, right? right. If, it, if its customers don't like what it's doing, they voluntarily remove their, their dollars. In a system like we have today, well, he's gone now. You don't, so he's holding them up now. Like, so what, what, what economic incentive would there be for holding everybody up just to steal their money? That's what government does. Well, but that's, see, that's, you know, right, no, but, but see, that's what, it's like, I, so they kind of like talking about government, because like, you're very heavy on social contract theory, which has like the consent, but what if they're like really, so like, you're, as you, as you posited, there really is no, Consent. What if at some point, like, hey, the U.S. we haven't invaded Taiwan, but we own Taiwan, or China, or China owns Taiwan, because if we ever want them off the face of the planet at some point in time, we can make that happen. So, like, can you ever get away from from just hard power? Like, can that go away at some point? If I'm understanding your correct, I think you asked a bunch of questions. If I'm understanding your basic question. It's that we need government to protect us from government. No, it's not. Like my question revolves around the fact that, as sad as it is, like violence and force does something and is very hard to get away from. I mean, there is a state of anarchy, like in IR, right? Like international relations is a state right. of anarchy. Right. So like, yeah, a lot of the principles principles you're talking about like work there. But at the end of the day, like you can't get away from super hard power if someone through whatever it means, like, hey, he was a great businessman at first and you know he really provided an awesome service, but hell, he has all the chips now. He has all the he has all the how does he, how does he get the chips? He has, all the guns. Guns. he has all the guns. Well, so that's from people giving to them consenting them, right? Because this is Okay, so then we just re bought into it. so then <laughs> everyone just bought into a government. No, because because they 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 because you give they money. You give up. money to a company because it serves your interests, right or wrong? If we initially, what if he changes the deal after he has all the guns? Then you like, are not his customer. Like, like it's not like, like it's the idea is like so. Is there a way you can get away from hard power being important? From it being from just a, from just the nuts and bolts of the situation being you're giving me your stuff or I'm putting a bullet in your head. Can you get away from? Well, if we're talking about hard power, um, and we're talking about defense of the continent, we're talking about defense of... No, 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 I'm talking about internally. I'm saying, like, like, we got rid of government, and then we gave this guy money, and he has a ton of guns, and he's right. great, always gonna be and then now he's stealing from all of us. Like, how do you get away from that scenario? Well, it's not a because he can't. There's different companies. Yeah, I mean, there would be different... All right, he killed all the other companies. He has all the weapons. I mean, this is, he's this great. Is, I mean, what I talked about in the bad police force, how it's an economic impossibility. It's because that people would freeze his... Uh, funds. If, if people, I mean, people would freeze his funds. They would the um, utility companies would freeze the water in his company and all. I mean, there would be a million ways to go about this. I think. Ooh, what you're, I, you're know. I don't know. I think it's a big gamble. I think well, government's a big gamble. Giving have government all the <laughs> guns, all the money, all the power, and say here, limit yourself. See, I guess. I guess like my. Where somebody's back door and my funds to. Right. 
society is based on is creating decentralization and taking it apart and having everything spread out. The same way um, there was more freedom in the Articles of Confederation. Yes, we had to, we went to a constitution for security, but there was a lot more freedom in the in Articles of Confederation. Exactly, but the, the, the smaller, more, multiple groups like in the Articles of Confederation, right. because there's a need for bigger and uh, centralized power. Because it's the Articles of Confederation. Is there, is there a need for forced centralized power? Is that what Outside of that, in these communities, so that the norm will be these communities, and over time they're going to again centralize. Yeah. And then you just you just resetting the political history. You're not there's not a solution. It's just going back to square one. Back to where we are now. Where we are now is it, I mean, where we started. America started to where it's going. It's going right back to where it was. So I'm talking before America. Right. You're talking about if we have an anarchist society. Day one. same society we had and start from a decentralized government and get a more centralized because you think that's right and then that's going to turn into anarchy or that's going to turn into you know despotism whatever but he's saying at the beginning you're starting with something totally different you're starting with a different uh, system that's set up from the ground floor and then it would build into something different and this is the this point that it's just to start these conversations and that's what I wanted to do was more so than anything throw a big elephant in the room get it out of here and start us to talk about why do we need government? How can we get off the government's goal? What are alternatives to government services? Even if we decided one day that, okay, well, government is the only way, and it is the only way we can provide for a military, that's fine, but somebody's got to have this conversation. Otherwise, we're doomed to repeat history. And that's what